All right, um, so I would like to uh, welcome all of you now to um, the webinar by Asia School of Business. Um, we're going to learn today on digital platforms and the new world, um, and in particular, sort of how digital platforms can solve some problems um, brought by the pandemic. And so before I go ahead and start, I'd like to introduce the panelists first. Um, so we have here Chen Chao Yo, who is the co-founder of the Fave Group. Um, the Fave Group, I think, uh, does not need any introduction, but it's a mer uh, next generation merchant digital platform in Southeast Asia. Um, Chen Chao is also the co-founder of KFIT. Hi, Chen Chao. Um, Hello, everyone. And he, he was also the uh, regional ops director for Groupon and um, worked for Job Street before and uh, was a management consultant for Accenture. Um, he graduated from Cornell and also was an Eisenhower Fellow. So thank you uh, for joining us today, Jin Chao. Um, and from the China Construction Bank, we have uh, Ka Kang Kai. Hi, Kang Kai. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. He's the first vice president, um, and he joined CCB in August 2017. Um, he has multifunction experience across credit risk management, marketing, and financial analysis. And currently, he oversees the overall risk culture in the bank, um, and he works across risk and compliance disciplines. And he has a master's degree in business and a bachelor's degree in finance. Uh, welcome, Kankai. Hi. And uh, I am Lati. I'm a professor, an assistant professor of economics here at Asia School of Business. I also hold an affiliation at MIT as a research affiliate. Um, my sort of main uh, topic um, that I study is industrial economics and platforms, actually. So um, what I'm going to do today is both moderate the session, but also um, give you a little bit of theory on a very basic theory on sort of what platforms are all about and what makes them different than traditional businesses. All right. So um, one housekeeping thing before this, um, there is, as you can see sort of on your screen, a Q&A box. Um, feel free as uh, we're sort of going along um, the session to ask whatever question you'd like. And for those of you who you know, are a bit shy to ask, um, there is sort of this upvote button that you can press and we will try and highlight the questions that get a lot of um, upvotes. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, I'm here basically to sort of give you a little bit of theory and in particular sort of a very quick and dirty introduction to platforms. Um, so what really is a platform, right? And so I started my research on dating websites. So you'll probably hear a lot of sort of online dating examples. Um, so I think a lot of you perhaps are familiar with Tinder, um, right? So swipe left, swipe left, swipe right, um, Tinder. Um, so Tinder, if you consider it um, connecting, say, you know, women and men, essentially is acting as an intermediary. So platforms really, the way we want to think about them as intermediaries connecting groups of people who may otherwise be separate. Um, now, we're not going to go into this uh, today, but there's a lot of theory around sort of how to start up a platform, how to scale up, how to um, sort of manage the dynamics of people on the platform. But, you know, what I wanted to keep in mind is this idea of intermediation. And of course, um, platforms can be of multiple sides. So before Tinder, you can think about it as sort of being a two-sided platform. You know, Google perhaps is a three-sided platform, right? So platforms can have many sides depending on what the platform is. And the idea as a platform operator, as I'm sure we're gonna hear later from the panelists, is that you sort of wanna keep each of the sides happy, right? So Google has to keep the users happy, the websites happy, and also the, the advertisers happy because that's a large portion of how it makes its profit. Now, today specifically, we're going to try and focus on this idea of digitalization, in particular, going from a world, a very sort of high contact world. So if you look at this, this is a Ramadan bazaar, um, you know, something that Malaysians really like in this month. Um, but of course, with the pandemic, something like this has become sort of a hotbed for um, infections, right? And so how do we basically move from a world like this to a world where perhaps, you know, touch is lessened, um, we're digital, you can sort of interact with the same people perhaps, but sort of on um, a platform, an online platform. So we're gonna be talking about, so, you know, the process of digitalization of businesses um, in the context of the current situation that we're in. Now, you may be asking yourself, you know, why are platforms different than traditional businesses? And the main thing here is to keep in mind um, the idea of network effects. So network effects are sort of this idea that, you know, the more of the service or product you use, 
um, the more useful it is for other users. So the example I wanted to start off here was with um, Mac iOS. So if you think about um, the iOS system, it connects you know, people who use iOS, so people like me who have um, an iPhone, and then it connects me to basically um, people who develop apps, right? So my smartphone is only useful for me because I have all these apps I can use. And so the idea is that the more people who have smartphones, the more likely it is for software developers to want to develop apps. And the more um, software developers there are out there, the more apps there are. So the more likely I am to use an iPhone over, say, another phone. Right. So the network effects part is really what makes platforms different than traditional businesses. So that's all for me, I think, in terms of the content. I'm going to now pass it on to the panelists to sort of explore these issues a little bit and also um, talk specifically about you know, your platform and sort of what you're doing. All right, so for Ching Chao, um, maybe you can give us a little bit of introduction on Fave and sort of what Fave does. I know it's a huge ecosystem of different services. There's a wallet, there's a deals. So um, give us a sense of, of Fave. Yeah, thanks a lot, Professor Melati. Yeah, hi everyone and good afternoon. Yeah, so I think for Faith, we call ourselves a merchant digital platform. So I think where, where we do, and I think what, as what Professor Tisal shared, I think it's basically a platform that connecting two sites, right? So I think on our two sites will be a merchant and a consumer. So I think maybe for the next 30 seconds, I think think of yourself as a offline restaurants, right? So you run a cafe uh, there. So I think what Faith does is basically uh, enable uh, or this cafe to fully digitize. So enable you where, think of it, you don't have much capex, you don't have much people that will know digital. How do you be able to accept multiple payments options, driving vouchers to deals towards all the cons big consumers that haven't gone approach to your cafe, drive retention, loyalty to back to your store, upsell, cross-sell, digital gift cards, review ratings, financing, analytics, uh, let's say low touch where the digital menu, take away, and a bunch of stuff. So basically, I think the way is that think of whatever Starbucks, McDonald's can do. How do we enable any cafe to be able to do that with no capex? So I think sort of what we do and connecting to help the businesses, restaurant cafes to serve their consumers. All right. Thanks, Jin Chow. Um, so uh, we're going to explore a little bit more sort of what Fave does in just a second. But I want to move on to our second panelist now, Kang Kai. Um, can you right. tell us a little bit about... CCB and the platform that CCB is uh, has uh, recently launched, and sort of you know what brought um, that uh, initiative forward. Uh, thanks, Professor Melati, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, CCB Malaysia. It might be sound very uh, unfamiliar to every one of you. So CCB Malaysia is one of the subsidiary uh, of China Construction Bank Corporations, which is one of the largest bank uh, in the world. So uh, we have uh, obtained our license in October 2016. And today I would like to introduce this uh, Match Plus program to everyone. And this is actually a matchmaking program. It's a smart matchmaking platform for those uh, businesses in Malaysia, if let's say they have some um, demands or they want to source for some materials or services uh, uh, from the customer in China, they can actually go to this platform. And at the same time, it allowed them actually to publish their information. And I know, I know that uh, Malaysia, we have a lot of potential businesses. They have the ego actually to go to global stage. And this would be the best thing for them. And CCB acts as, as a third party uh, platform provider uh, to connect all these uh, domestic and also overseas markets. And maybe some numbers might be helpful for you to understand about this platform. We have now about 610,000 uh, users for this platform and more than 900,000 services, product, and even projects within the platform. So far as of today, we have completed more than 50,000 deals, uh, help uh, those businesses to uh, actually match their demand. And apart from that, actually, we also provide like online uh, virtual uh, conference hall where actually you can have your uh, expo or can have your forums via the platform. So why we have uh, we start to embark on this initiative? Three main things. First, uh, we would like to serve the real economy. This is the role and the nature of a bank. Uh, financial system is the major fundamental system in the process of economy and social development. 
as so happened to us, we would like to utilize and adopt the technologies that is available uh, within the group right now. We have AI, big data, and all these things. We develop a global platform so that we can serve our people here. And the second one is actually we would like to connect the people. And the purpose of this platform is to bring the world together. For example, the virtual uh, conference platform, everyone can sit together and also exchange their uh, ideals and uh, is actually uh, on the platform. And the last one is actually the nature of the bank. A bank is supposed to be a dynamic in nature and with the demand changes of uh, our consumer right now, we would like to actually think of something different to add value to our consumer and also to provide innovative uh, solution for them. And uh, this platform will be good for them because uh, apart from the platform, uh, we as a bank we can provide a full range of professional financial service, for example, credit, account, and all those uh, remittance uh, to help them to facilitate all these uh, cross-border transactions. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Kankai. So um, I think kind of, you know, we kind of sort of get a sense of both the, the platforms right now. Um, and I would like to move a little bit to sort of thinking about, you know, how is business right now, right? So how has the pandemic affected you guys um, in both of your platforms? And, you know, sort of has anything changed? Have you seen sort of, you know, portions of the platform that are doing better than others? Um, so so I guess Chen Chao, maybe we can go first. Yeah, thanks a lot, Professor. Yeah, so I think that in terms of COVID-19, I think as we all know, right? So today is a, for Malaysia, today is exactly nine weeks since the movement control order happens. So I think the, during this past nine weeks, right, I think definitely a lot of things have shifted, right? So I think for Faith, we serve the offline local merchants. So think of it, your restaurants, the offline retailers, the beauty salon, travels, attractions, and everything. So I think this is affected definitely. So I think the two the way to the way LA is two ways, right? So I think towards our overall grand scheme, a big picture vision, this is great, right? It's because this helps to drive towards digitalizations. I think our vision is to help offline businesses digitalize. And I think I'm, some of you may have seen some WhatsApp or Facebook where people were spreading around who 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 resp most responsible for the drive digitalizations. And I think the whether it's a CIO, CTO, CEO, and I think likelihood the, the, the one that drive the fastest is actually COVID, right? So I think this helps businesses to drive digitalization across board. I think the last 10 years, you see digitalization in the consumer. We started use, uh, using technology to book our rides, we buy things online and everything, right? But businesses hasn't really transformed that much. And I think this is a great uh, way we see. Let's say example, we have always wanted to drive digital signatures. During COVID period, it's 100% digital signature, right? Because people can't meet mm. to go in. Right, let's say even banks. Right? I think there was once we wanted to open bank account, they did a video live streaming like Zoom and see me video uh, signing on a piece of paper. Right, so I think they, they all innovate. I think back then, I can't imagine three months ago telling a bank that I'm going to do a video Zoom in to sign for them. They will tell me no. So I think that the, that's a part that I think we want to drive in. So I think the in the short run, definitely, I think there's effect where people don't has not able to go out for dine in to buy retails during the period. So I think is that and now at this period where Malaysia has sort of partially opened. So I think it's the last two three weeks seeing the recovery. I think we see the different offline businesses. Some of them adapt very fast. Some of them gradually catching up. Some of them are still uh, in disbelief that this is happening. So I think it's key is I think for businesses is to get past their own barrier and saying okay this is happening and this will happen and I think things will not go back to exactly the norm like previously right so I think whenever we hold the cash I think physical paper money I think people will be scared of it so I think I haven't touched physical money for nine weeks <laughs> and I think many people hasn't so yeah. that would shift right so I think that uh, push will move through and I think as we drive through this is how do you make it easier cheaper better faster with digital and technology right? it's not just for the sake of doing it but every process this is a good chance to make it faster easier cheaper better thank you I actually wanted to ask you specifically about sort of how you see um, e-wallets but you kind of spoke a little bit um, to that. So um, I think there's a, a sort of a sense in which uh, consumers have become a bit spooked, right? So even though the, the MCO restrictions have sort of been been loosened a bit, like like what you said, right? Like this 
this like touching things is sort of becoming something that consumers don't want to do. So maybe you can you elaborate a little bit on, you know, e-wallets and sort of how you see that happening. I think I read an article recently that said in Malaysia, there are more than 40, I think, e-wallets. Um, and so it's a very rich, I think, environment. Um, so, yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think one contrary to most people believe, Faith is Faith Pay is not an e-wallet. This why we have the word ah, pay behind it. Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately, our loyalty services put the name with the pay before everyone launched the e-wallet. So I think e-wallet I is basically to know what is e-wallet is like. You just have to top up money inside, right? So basically, boost, grab mm. pay, touch and go. You just have to load in money. So Faith Pay, Samsung Pay, actually you don't load in money inside. So there's a two groups of it, but we are all I on see. digital payment, cashless payment. And contactless right. payment, right? So I think it's towards the similar aspects, but I think the method is different. So for Faith, we are basically agnostic on payment methods. So you can use Faith Pay using a credit card, debit card. You can use it via e-wallet, let's say like Boost. You can even use Asia points on Faith Pay. So I think basically accepting wow. different payment methods towards it. So I think to, to drive that transition. So I think from the consumer side, I think that people doesn't want to touch the money and hence this fully on digital work drive through. And I think the bigger enemy for I think e-wallet print prior to this is actually cash. The bulk of our economy is still very cash-based. So I think as we go on it, I think this will help to a lot of visibility as well. Because I think one of the barrier pre-COVID for businesses not going on any e-wallet or cashless payment is actually people doesn't want to leave trace. Right? So I think especially the cash, pure cash economy. So I think this will be a good uh, impetus to drive everyone towards it. And I think maybe one day we'll be like like how China is, right? Where 100% is on digital. And I think with digital, one thing is that, let's say right now, government talk about contact tracing, tracing who has gone to a restaurant and everything. Any payment that's using any of digital cashless payment is actually traced because we actually know who paid mm. where or what time. So I think that is sort of one step. It's just that today government couldn't fully rely on this because not 100% transactions on that. And hence, there's still a manual uh, contact. And I think the other one that would drive towards here would be digital manual. I think you're going to see over the next couple of months, more and more places are going to embark on digital menu, where you're not going to get a physical piece of menu because that menu has been touched by many other customers. So you Thousands can scan, of people. <laughs> yeah. They're going to scan some QR or some form on a website or some form of technology to get that piece of menu and just order. And then I think that will save the time for waiter as well because that order will go straight to kitchen and hopefully reduce a bit of the time for you to get the food. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, I was recently at a mall and they had me scan a QR code to fill in uh, a form before I went in for contact tracing. So uh, very interesting uh, sort of uh, dynamics happening, I think, in in in, um, in this space. All right. So let's go to Kankai before we kind of explore some of these other issues. So in terms of um, CCB and the Match Plus, so your, um, you know, uh, platform for um, obtaining all sorts of things, right, from medical supplies to everything, right? Maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Um, so sort of where do you see the impact of this platform in the time of the pandemic? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Professor Menati. So maybe I give you some background of this platform. It's actually, the platform was launched in December last year, 2019, just in time actually to assist, assist a lot of uh, businesses for them to source for uh, medical supplies, especially during this pandemic. So two things that I would like to highlight, the impact that I can see from this program. I agree with what Chen Chao said just now, cheap, better, and fast, and how we are able to do it and how our business is able to do it. First, they have to utilize better utilize their resources, which means that uh, they have to enhance their productivity uh, to have better access to better market. And let me share with you some experience that we have during this pandemic uh, period. So we have approached by one of our customer and uh, guess what? This customer is actually a polystyrene recycling company. And what they are going to do is they want to repurpose their production line into uh, uh, those medical supplies product. They are going to uh, use the polystyrene to make it into plastic resin. And what they do normally is they send back to China to produce the photo frame. And now they are going to do is they repurpose their production line. They produce a uh, facial for uh, medical uh, uh, supplies. And um, what this platform is able to help them is uh, they approach us and we help them actually to onboard into the platform. They publish their demands for financial support uh, to their parents' company in China. 
And the same information has been picked up by our counterparty, uh, one of the CCB branches in China. Financing has been given, has been given timely to them and they are able to produce the product on time, actually. So now, of course, definitely they uh, have a better revenue and better performance. And the second impact I would uh, like to share with you is actually what I can see uh, the benefit of this program during uh, this COVID-19 outbreak is uh, for those local businesses to gain access to a uh, global market and to minimize the impact of uh, supply chain disruptions. And why I say so, maybe I give you some example, one of the real life example that we encountered. So one of our customers is actually a manufacturing company and uh, they want to produce a uh, face mask, the surgical face mask. But uh, back to two years, uh, two months time ago, you might not be able to find any uh, raw material because a lot of country, they actually banned the export of this uh, fiber. Uh, the fabric for the uh, surgical mask. And what they do is uh, they approach us and we discuss how best we can help. And via the platform, they actually publish their demand, what they want in the platform. And this information has been picked up by other uh, Europe uh, customer, Europe supplier. And the product has been supplied to them timely and they can produce these medical supplies just in time to help those uh, uh, businesses uh, and also to fight against the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And uh, these are the two impact and two observations that I see uh, the benefit from this program, especially in context of COVID-19. Thank you for that. Um, there's something that I've been wondering a lot for, for both of you, actually. So, um, you know, you always hear all these Consumers always hear these, these stories about how the economy is collapsing, things are really bad, small businesses are sort of shutting down, et cetera, right? So um, since both of you sort of deal with, you know, the merchant side of things, um, I guess two questions. So one, um, are you seeing sort of more merchants drop off your platform? And two, is there anything you are doing to sort of try and get them on or to stay on, like, for example, you know, lessening your, your, your onboarding time or anything like that. Um, in particular, you know, just because it is a very tough situation for a lot of businesses because of the pandemic. So maybe we can go to Chin Chao and then um, come to Kankai. Yeah, thanks, Professor Melati. Yeah, so I think in terms of, I think the impact of the economy, I think is real. I think that, I think you definitely hit everyone, right? I think unprecedented multiple into it, right? I think it's not just a uh, health related, but so economy related oil related and multiple aspects so i think definitely there's a huge impact across and in different businesses different individual impact i think never in our life we imagine that billions of people in the whole world couldn't go to work right we have never imagined that yeah. all restaurants couldn't open for dining in right i think that's something that no business planning as you think of it that businesses when you do the planning in like december last year or january this year no one actually anticipated this right so i think there's something different so i think that in terms of I think on the businesses, whether other businesses that got Im impacted, definitely yes. I think like the in terms of coming on platform, I think definitely we see a lot of coming on. So let's say during the MCO, the number of merchants that come on board us is actually three, four times compared to normal time. So I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of more coming in to digitalize. I think what we see is a lot of brands that previously never considered platforms because their business traditionally was very strong. Now mm -hmm. they start coming on board, right? So I think, and then I think the other one is collaboration as well. Big platforms that previously may not consider small startups or platform like us started to consider. So I think like recently we did a collaboration with Facebook and Instagram to enable all the local merchants on our platform to surface on Facebook, right? To, to mm -hmm. enable consumers to purchase via Facebook. So I think that's one of the aspects, right? So I think in terms of what we have done, I think one of the first initiatives we did within I think three, four days after MCO started in Malaysia was something we call saveourfaith.com. So basically save our favorite restaurant and retailers. And then we were yeah. lucky that a bunch of uh, celebrities as well, Harif Iskandar, a bunch of DJs, a bunch of celebrities came on board, media as well. And I think like we together, we work with thousands of local businesses to come together. And I think the concept was straightforward. I think for us, uh, we waive all our charges, we absorb all the credit card fees as well. I think from the businesses, they put an offer 
for let's say example 80 ringgit for 100 ringgit or something like that consumer would pay today we will pay the businesses immediately and then this then and the today may mean march april right during the mco lockdown so the businesses get the cash so that they can pay their employees or rental or other overheads and the consumer has six months to spend at the restaurants so i think one is to get have the businesses to fight through the period and then the second is to help the businesses to recover fast as well because i think let's say in the last two weeks we see that and right now the malaysia with the relaxation of cmco I think people are still not fully confident, right? So I think there are people that who are more confident of going out, but I think is people are still worried. So I think if you go to the mall, like last night I was at Wan Utama, I think that even in the dinner time, including Buka Puasa time, where usually it's super big and all tables are taken, I think there's still a lot of restaurants that's pretty empty, right? Something that un, un, unknown of. And I think that's that is the same case everywhere, right? So I think that's one of the aspects. So I think we let's say the trend the last two weeks we started seeing was I think the first few days of partial open we see more people go out for lunch but not during lunch time 11 something a.m lunch 2 30 p.m lunch so they want to go out mm. eat food but they don't dare to go out then after a few days people start going the first weekend where people can go out people start going more at lunch time and i think the last few days we started seeing more and more people start going out in the evening time and then book right. a pasta. i think the next where government will open up, allow more people to open up until later and everything, I think we'll gradually see the effect. Nice. Um, thank you. So I want to ask, again, the same two questions to Kankai. I know you mentioned a little bit with sort of helping um, your suppliers of financing, but maybe you can you can talk a little bit more on that. I think you're on mute, by the way. Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Professor Malati. So uh, actually, pretend to your question just now, uh, we don't see actually there is a drop of demand. In fact, a lot of customers that they don't even know about platform, they don't even have any exposure to this platform, they come to us, they actually came to us and uh, to ask about what kind of service or value added things that we can provide. And uh, actually for this platform, what we can see is uh, during the first few months when we launched this platform in Malaysia, which is actually back to in uh, after Chinese New Year in February, um, we have only like 10 people sign in, uh, sign up as a user. But um, surprisingly, within two months, we have increased the uh, subscriber. And now we have more than uh, 50, uh, more than 80 users actually subscribed into this uh, platform. And don't be surprised that actually for Malaysia contacts, we actually managed to close up more than 40 deals just within two months. And you can actually see nowadays, a lot of people requesting for all these uh, platform and all these um, channel for them actually to solve for material. And um, just share with you uh, one of my personal exp uh, experience, uh, my uncle actually. My uncle is actually a wholesale uh, trader in Malaysia. And what they normally do is they fly over, travel over to China, to source for the material, to source for all those uh, products, the merchandise, and sell it back to Malaysia. And during this COVID-19, none of us is able to travel abroad. And it doesn't mean that they have to close their shop. They don't need to do any business. Not necessary, because uh, through this platform, they actually uh, sign up. I asked my uncle to sign up. My uncle actually managed to connect with the supplier. And this is not medical product. This is something stationary and all those uh, basic necessity. And they managed to contact with the supplier uh, directly to get cheaper costs for them. Then this actually to help out those uh, businesses, especially the small businesses in Malaysia, to actually get better resource, better kind of products from China directly. And what I'm, I'm going to say is here, because as of today, this platform has been just been launched for not more than five months. And uh, of course, I would say this is a supply in China, but we are actually uh, expanding right now. We are asking all our overseas uh, network branches actually to go to whole worldwide and ask uh, other, other country suppliers to log in and to register themselves. So moving forward, what you can see, not in Malaysia and China, but it's actually connected the worldwide. And what we want to create is to bring the world together especially in this connected world. And uh, go, go back to the question that since now you uh, highlight about the financing service. Um, maybe for you, Mike, because this platform is not only for you to uh, 
publish your product and services. You can even raise your request if let's say you need financing, especially for cross-border activities. You have a project in China, you need financing, your company in China need financing. You can actually log into the platform, register yourself, be that authenticated user for the platform, post your demands. And I believe all those partners that within the platform, especially our CCB branches, if let's say your project is potential, has the potential to grow, definitely they will lend a, uh, a hand, a helping hand to you to help you to grow your business. So the COVID-19 outbreak, the impact, of course, I'm not going to deny everyone feel the, the, the heat, everyone feel the impact. But how we are going to go through it is actually better to better utilize the resources that you have. Yeah, I think that is what I want to share uh, regarding to your question just now, Rati. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely sort of see a lot of, I think, value in this idea of intermediation, right? So, so I think both of you spoke a lot about, you know, connecting groups and stuff like that. But I think one of the questions um, in the Q&A, and if I may remind people tuning in, um, you should upvote questions that you want to sort of, you know, hear the answer to just so that I get a sense of what to um, pivot the, the discussion towards. But, you know, one thing that people always ask with the use of anything digital, really, right, is, is data. So I know, Kankai, you spoke a little bit about, um, you know, the AI and sort of everything like that, right? So I think that's something that a lot of platforms are using a lot, yeah. you know, sort of this um, very curated experience. Um, but perhaps, you know, one of the Q&A was asking, you know, how do you see people's um, perhaps fear of their data being misused, right? Something people hear about a lot. Um, so can you speak a little bit about that and sort of what your platform does to perhaps safeguard people's data and stuff like that? So maybe go back to Chen Chao and then come back to Kang Kai. Yeah, thanks a lot, Professor. Yeah, so I think data privacy and every, I think security is definitely very core. So I think that I think that's something that I think uh, utmost investments to make sure that all those things are there. So I think like, let's say even myself, I would not be able to even see a consumer email or phone number. So basically, let's say within the data core, basically everything we see is a reference ID, right? So every user is seen as an ID and I think everything else is done through that and then it could basically encrypted through before you can get it through to send an email or push notification. So basically the goal is how do you make sure the security is there and yet personalized, right? So I think it's how to do that both at the same time and driving that to, to make that happen. So I think that is always the key, right? So I think for consumer, if there's no personalization, then to the consumer, there's a spam because it's basically yep. sending random things. But then if it's, so then the question is, how do you personalize without having a human reading it? But I think think of it as a segment, think of it as a station because it's the messaging, whether it's the push notification, whether it's an email, whether in the in-app is the right message to the right people at the right time, right? So I think that's the right, the thing. So I think that will be key. So I think let's say for the merchant side, the data, again, is super important that it, the data is on this, that could be the competitive advantage for them, or actually the private secret information for them, right? So they imagine that right now we, let's say there are a thousand bakeries on Faith platform. We definitely need to make sure that the a thousand bakery each only see their own data and not anyone else data. The only thing they can get is a comparison against benchmark within this whole group, right? Where it cannot be identified who, what is the information. You can compare against the same location, the same category, right? So I think that's sort of ways. I think one of the things that we did on analytics is using machine learning, where every month, all the 35,000 businesses on Faith actually get a 30 slides to analyze the business, to tell them that what's the percentage of new customers, nice. 32 customers, the demographics, let's say female age 31 to 40, how much they're spending, how frequent they repeat versus the other demographics, what day, what time their shops is, is full, what time is empty. So basically, I think a lot of this thing for online platform is actually very normal. But I think for the offline businesses, actually a lot of them have never seen that. So I think our goal mm -hmm. is, think of it as like for a big brands, let's say a Starbucks thing, like who have analysts analyzing it. How do we enable that for every businesses? So I think it's take it up and then basically build it through. For them. So I think that's what we have been building. And I think all the slides and everything are created fully automated, fully digitized with no human being. Thank you, Xin Chao. Uh, Kankai, do you want to take the same question? Yeah, thanks, um, Lati. 
So uh, maybe I would like to share with you some data protections uh, that has been put in place. Of course, uh, data protections is our most important uh, for us, especially in this platform. And uh, for the platform, we actually comply with the standards and also all the compliance required for banking industry, especially for uh, China, uh, those uh, regulators. And uh, the data, I can say, it can be divided into two types. First is the data that you want to be uh, shown to the public, the information, the customer, uh, the product, the services that you want to provide, you want to show to other people. And the second one is the personal data that you are not going to share with others. So first thing, for these two data, we will have different kinds of measures or different kinds of uh, uh, level of access for the uh, platform user. Even at end, at our end, we will not be able to see the information. All the information will be uh, scripted. So for personal data, especially, if let's say uh, all this information that you want to share, our system will give you some notification that you are not allowed to share your personal information. If only you want to share, then we would be able to do that. So this is actually a reminder to our user and also uh, to one of the ways to protect the data data in the, in the platform. And um, so far, we actually process a lot of uh, applications and a lot of people, they want to register. Uh, they actually send us the request and help them to onboard. And all the information has been uh, kept in our server. And this server is actually a private cloud. The cloud is owned by our CCD. No one is able to access, which is actually secure. And uh, all the information, there is no human intervention because we have AI technology. All the information uh, has been uh, processed without human interventions. And that is uh, to ensure the data protections uh, for this platform. Yeah. Thank you, Kankai. Um, so it seems, of course, like it, it's, it's really um, nice to hear, I think, from the consumer side, how the data protection works. Like Jin Chao was saying, I think it's just sort of very normal for online platforms, but something that, you know, sort of the brick and mortars of the world perhaps uh, may not be very used to. And so I kind of wanted to, to come back to sort of this, this last question, and then I'll go to Q&A a little bit. But, you know, kind of what do you see being, you know, the future of businesses like yours in the world post-COVID, right? So in particular, um, I think one thing people are asking now is, you know, are businesses ready to digitalize, right? Like, are they ready to actually, you know, embark on this very um, different journey perhaps and what they were envisioning for for themselves and you know what what are your comments on that so chin chow maybe we start with you and then we go to kankai yeah so i think in december last year i actually had a i was fortunate that just before pre-covid i actually spent two weeks in hangzhou china at alibaba campus so i actually nice. spent two weeks to learn on how digital works how the cashless and everything right i didn't live a life in Hang hangzhou and i think during that two weeks, I did not touch any China Remedy cash, even though I could, right? I think even when I go to the shops, let's say with a cafe, I wanted to pay cash. They basically had a box there and said, put in any cash you want, but there's no change. So they are not even entertained any change, right? So even during that time. So I think the is everything just like, I still remember they went to the toilet. And if you want to take toilet paper, you scan the QR to get the toilet paper, right? You say Alipay or WeChat Pay. So I think it's moving the digital fully. Let's say restaurants there, almost no restaurant has a waiter waitresses to serve you. They are, the waiter waitresses are there to bring food for you, but not to uh, not to bring menu for you. So maybe think of it, right? Maybe explain a way that is think of it today in Malaysia, right? So you pre-COVID, you go to restaurants, you first they get you to your seat. Second, they bring the wait, bring the menu to your table. So that's a one step, right? And after that, come back to you when you're ready to order. And then stand there 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes for you to order. And then after that, uh, walk away, then bring food to you. And then after that, when you call them for bill, they walk towards you, oh, no, that you have a bill. Then they bring a bill to you. Then after that, you give them credit cards. Then they walk back, put in the credit, bring a credit card machine for you to key in the PIN code. And then after that, they walk away, right? And then they come back again to collect the plates. But I think if you think on a world where it's fully digitalized, you walk in, you just sit down, you open up the phone, you just scan a QR, you just order on your phone, you press the button, you pay, and the food will come and serve to you. So they only need to bring the food to serve to you. And then when you're finished, done, you just walk out, and then you earn a cash back for your next visit. And then you they uh, they only come back to collect the place. So every part of it will be fully digitalized and cut through, right? So I think those are all very possible. Technology is already. I think that we started seeing the 
in Singapore, a lot more businesses start going on. And I think we started analyzing on the businesses that embark on this. People actually order more because a lot of time mm. when you go with a few people, you feel shy that your friends know that you eat a lot or you feel shy that uh, <laughs> you made a way. I don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they don't split bill, right? Because you can, everyone just take a phone and just scan them. Order. So that means everyone pay from your own phone. So you don't need to worry about my friend not yet paid me and everything, right? So I think there are multiple ways. I think those are just some of the ways, right? But I think the post-COVID, I think it's a low-touch, contactless way. I think everyone will feel very worried if they start to have any form of contact. So I think that's where I think these things will gradually build. And I think we all will together shape that norm. All right? I think that, and I think this is our FMB, but if you think of it in every other sector, the things will be like that. A little like, I, I think maybe three months ago, you may not have imagined doing attending or doing so many webinars on video. And I think in the last two months, I think you have done more webinars on video than your, free, <laughs> your whole life. right? This so is very that. true. And now you can get married through Zoom as well. So it's a, it's a boundless world. I'm actually yeah. attending a Zoom wedding next, next, uh, next week. So yeah, going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's be exciting, All right. yeah. Yeah, I know. Very different world. Um, Kang Kai, do you want to speak a little bit about the future of, of platforms and whether or not, you know, CCB thinks that businesses are ready to, to digitalize? Okay. Uh, thanks, Malachi. So uh, perhaps uh, talking about platforms, uh, I believe that platform will likely become the preferred and also the dominant business model for a lot of uh, businesses and even for banking industry. So nowadays, people spend most of their majority of their time on the digital platform. Uh, those parents that have kids, I'm not so sure how, how long uh, every day your, your kids spend time on digital platform. So therefore, businesses, they have to position themselves to what actually their customer are and actually to create a corresponding strategy in order to cater for the uh, change of this uh, environment. And it's very important for them to have this in order for them to be sustainable. And but then uh, please take note that the path to success is by no means by no means easy because ultimately as platforms uh, you have to perform even better than the traditional one because uh, during the process you have a lot of uh, uh, challenges that you are going to face uh, the the debt obligations that you have to pay because a lot of investment they have to put in and um, you have to be socially financially and even politically viable uh, so that there is no. Um, a lot of compliance thing that you have to comply and so on. And now we are actually at the age of uh, platform economy. And actually platform is like a plug and play model, business model. Uh, everyone uh, can join together, uh, con connect with each other and uh, to exchange and create value. And in this today connected world, I think it is very important for us to stick together to make good use of all these platform. And talk, um, re regarding to what you said just now, whether our Malaysian enterprises, uh, whether they are ready to um, go with this platform to transform them, themselves into the platform. Um, not really, because uh, for big corporations, we can see a lot of people moving into, and a lot of startups, they actually start up uh, those uh, platforms. But a lot of uh, small enterprises, uh, they don't have a lot of capital, they don't have a lot of money, but they also need to actually have global presence, and they also need to tap on all these a platform in order for them to be present at global stage. And um, therefore, um, a lot of platforms like B2B, like us, uh, the, the CCB Best Plus, even like Faith, uh, actually will be able to help them to, um, to, to go to this global presence and to go to those platforms, everyone share the same. And uh, for financial sector itself, I think this platform for opportunities for those uh, banking, because uh, banking is able to access to all of these all this data, as what just now Chantal shared, uh, for faith, you actually will send a slide uh, to do analysis on the consumer behavior. And the same thing for banking, because uh, let me share with you some example, uh, the time where actually I go to visit uh, my counterparty, my parent bank in China. So uh, for, for a person, if let's say you walk into the branch, when they scan through your, your face, they, they actually can predict what actually you want. They understand what is the demand, what is your today, whether this person is very angry, she's going to complain something. So it helped this uh, business, uh, this uh, financial service provider, especially the staff to be prepared and to actually cater for the need to be more efficient. And uh, today, consumer expectation is different from the past. I believe that in future, 
is going to be changed. So as the uh, expectation change, the business must change their, their, their business model. And so for, uh, if let's say the traditional model would not be able to fit that, I believe platform will be able to do something on that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for everything that you've told us. Um, I'd like to now move to taking some Q&A questions, if that's all right. So I think we sort of have a sense of, um, you know, the value proposition of platforms, you know, how you're basically watching agility in motion, right? So people just, like you were saying, traditional businesses now, you know, onboard onto your platform and pivoting basically to, to options that make more sense for them in the time of the pandemic. Um, but I'm, I want to kind of go to uh, some of these Q&As really quick. So uh, from Ashraf here, we have um, the following. So public policy could likely become more attuned to the complexities of digital age with the cooperation of companies and governments. So what are the recommendations for policymakers in enabling the development of digital platforms to prepare for the new world that we're barreling into? So basically, what is your advice for policymakers? Um, in order to sort of support and maybe, um, you know, uh, push through this, this this world of platforms. Chin Chow. Yeah, so I think, yeah, definitely, I think as a push on this, I think policymaker, I think regulators, everyone, I think would need to basically get into in tune. So I think that one of it is, I think maybe even industry players, there are people that who would actually eventually join the policymakers or regulators to be part of that. To, to get to understand it and to be able to be part of it. So let's say people that have been in the five years, 10 years in digital world to go um, embark on it. And I think that would be maybe one aspect of it. Because I think the way we see the world is that today, the online world is getting more and more connected and borderless. And actually, our offline world is becoming more and more with border and less connected <laughs> right, with all this thing. So, and I think with all the connected world as well, the competition is now global. And for good or for bad, right? So I think for businesses that are ready, your market is now worldwide, right? And this actually adds a lot of complexity for policymakers, regulators, and everything, right? And I think if you flip the other way, it's your competition is also worldwide. Businesses that's not even here, how do you do it, right? So I think the key of it, I think is kind of talk about value add efficiency as well. I think is how do you be able to ensure that the objective of it to driving the economy and, and all those things are there, ensuring security, ensuring... So I think the table stake still need to be there. And I think enable a room for the industry player to shape, get fo uh, following a few key must, must do or must not do, right? So I think that's enable the new way for people to move. And I think as it grow, I think be able to ensure that it doesn't disrupt or affect the, our capital market, or banking sector or any other aspects, but enable the way. So I think the way thing of it, let's say banking is banks, I know Kanka is here, but maybe banks may or may not exist, but banking still needed, right? If you think of it, right? Yeah. It's just how to do the banking, right? So I think yeah. communication is still needed. It's just our old way of doing communication may or may not. Commerce is still needed. It's just the way of doing commerce may or may shift. So I think a lot of all these things are like that. So I think it's how do we adapt to it? I think thinking on the call and then how do we do it, right? So instead of back then, Maybe back then, some regulations are done to prevent. I think we, over the last 20, 50 years, we have done a lot of regulations policy to drive or prevent fraud or whatnot in the offline world. So right now with the digital world, how do you do it? And I think some markets, let's say China, Korea, some of the markets are ahead of us, right? And I think there's a lot of learning to do from them, from them as well. What are the things that they have done that could work, right? I think our counterparts in Singapore as well, I think a few of these markets have moved quite a bit ahead. And I think Malaysia is not far behind. I think that we have a good, friendly governments, uh, irrespective of the side, right? I think regulators, they are wanting to drive this. So I think in the end is how do we all work together as one and look into the whole sector and how do you do it? And I think within the players as well is how do we all come together to self-propose to how to regulate as well? I think play a fair game and go across, right? So I think maybe that's another aspect. Thank you, Jun Chao. Kan Kai. Okay, so I think um, in this connector world, we need to be more, I mean, it's like we need more collaborations uh, because uh, it's the same thing also to policymaker. And uh, just now I agree with what Jun Chao say, uh, learning. They actually, uh, our regulators or even uh, our policymakers, they have to learn from other country, advanced country that uh, they might have some insight that will be able to help our businesses. 
But uh, I do uh, one thing that I want to um, give a credit to our Malaysia's uh, regulator is actually uh, in the market. Actually, we do have a lot of uh, financing uh, assistance or financial assistance provided by the governments or even by the government agencies. Uh, they they are actually willing to provide financing at cheaper rate or even they can give grant to all those businesses who is qualified uh, for them to and uh, to enable them to tap into this uh, market. And um, uh, I, for regulator, I think one thing, the new approach actually is to work together and to actively participate in shaping this new landscape. Especially right now, um, we can see after COVID-19 is um, everyone moving toward the transformations, every business is moving to transformation. So the same thing to our policymaker, they have to do it quickly. They have to uh, talk to the talk to the ground, go to the businesses to understand what actually the challenges they are, they are facing right now and to come up with the best uh, policies or the best solutions for them. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, so, just, just talking about you know what we're talking about sort of the, this this post COVID world and, and what governments can do and stuff like that. People often speak about um, a sort of bigger problem that humankind will face, which is you know climate change, right? And sort of environmental issues um, that will probably hit us in the face in a couple of decades from now, if not earlier. Um, and so tying sort of you know this idea of uh, problems, right? That businesses sort of have to face, and with one of the questions asked on you know, kind of the environment, right? So from uh, one Mysara we have here, uh, what are some measures that have been adopted by digital platforms to help um, capitalizing or sort of, you know, build opportunities for better environmental outlooks, right? So, you know, thinking about the pandemic being a huge problem, let's say we get over the pandemic, then we have say climate change and sort of environmental issues um, sort of hitting us in the face. So what do you see the role of sort of platforms in helping towards this cause? Chin Chow, perhaps first. Okay, yeah. So I think environmental, I think definitely, I think is that there are some efforts being done, but definitely I don't think that's enough, right? So I think maybe maybe a few things that I think we can think of is, I think let's say take GrabFood, right? Or Food Panda. I think one of the initiatives that I think GrabFood has done was enable people to choose not to take cutlery. Right, and there's a default turn off cutlery, right? And I think that it will basically save, I, I don't know how many pieces, but lots of plastics every day, right? Because I think mm -hmm. one of the things during this COVID world, a lot of people are doing food ordering. And I think that drives it, right? So I think that's definitely one. I think digitalization as well, I think it will save a lot of paper, a lot of transportation. So I think in the last two months, I think we, a lot of us use our petrol a lot less. A lot of us go out a lot less. So I think re reducing in the CO2 and everything, right? So I think, all the businesses can play a part, right? So I think, let's say whether business travel, do we need to do that much of it? I think how if you can get drive businesses to do more digitalized. So let's say we talk about, let's say every month we have a few thousand businesses that uh, sign on board faith. For each of those that when you use a paper contract versus digital contract, you save printing of several pages of paper. There's a tens of thousands of pages of paper just from just that action alone, right? And let's say claims for the company, can the companies do digital claims versus paper claims, any other aspects that you can do. So I think it's a lot of it is in our, all our actions, I think, and I think every one of us can play a part in this. It's not just companies, it's not just if there's the leaders in the company. I think everyone in the company can play a part, everyone in the society can play a part, right? And I think together we can shape that as a consumer of a brand as well. And we make a conscious choice to see brands that drive more towards the causes that we believe in, right? whether climate, whether environment, whether any other issues, right? So I think is we all can play a part to move it. If all of us care a lot more about that, I think businesses, organizations, governments will all take actions towards that. Thank you, Jin Chao. Kang Kai. Yeah, uh, talking about environment. So I think like a platform user, because I believe that a lot of platforms, they can actually integrate into the company system, which allow them to have like paperless. Uh, those paperless, uh, actually, they reduce quite a lot of uh, those uh, uh, environments, uh, harm to environments. And uh, like one thing that I may need to share, because like, for example, like for our platform, we do have this online or uh, virtual conference. So recently, uh, our uh, counterparty in China, Shandong, and also counterparty in Thailand, they have this uh, export, uh, import uh, expo. So they do it online, virtually, 
So I, I believe that there will be a lot of safe, uh, saving. You don't need to actually waste a lot of uh, resources. You don't need to travel so far. Um, actually, it's, it's kind of a safe environment because to travel, uh, you have to incur a lot of uh, uh, cost to our environment. And especially if, let's say, you want to do a physical expo, you want to do exhibitions, instead of doing online, online you can even do it on, uh, on 3D mode. But uh, if you do a physical one, how much of paper, how much of uh, publications that you are going to waste, you are, you are going to use that for, uh, that means uh, to capitalize on these uh, environment uh, issues. So all these actually uh, platform will be able to help to uh, shape the people mind to help out to focus on our natural environments. I think this is all the platform that will be able to help out. Thank you, uh, Kang Kai, and thank you, uh, Jin Chao, both. I, I wish we could uh, talk more about this, but unfortunately, I think we, we kind of have a hard stop at 3.45. Um, so just to conclude a little bit, um, so again, like I think one thing that we were constantly hearing about was this idea of connecting, right? And so Jin Chao mentioned, you know, the world is big, but somehow it's also kind of limited in a sense, right? So I, I put this slide up, you know, a connected but socially distant world. So sort of a, a low touch contactless world where um, I think platforms will play a bigger role sort of going forward, both for consumers and also for businesses. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to end on perhaps the following um, question, which is, so we're talking about digitalization, right? So um, sort of the final note here, what is sort of one piece of advice you could give um, a business that is trying to go digital? So just kind of quick and dirty, 30 seconds, your one piece of advice, because we have a very broad audience listening and some of them may be thinking of taking their businesses online, right? So tell me a little bit about that. 30 seconds, Jin Chao. Okay, I think start from the problem that you try to solve, right? So don't start from a digital technology, start from a problem you try to solve and use digital to make it easier, cheaper, better, faster. Nice. Less than 30 seconds. Cool. Can cut. Uh, 30 seconds. Okay, so digital business platforms are essential. Two things that you have to remember. You have to know what is the design outcome that you want to achieve. And the second one is you have to create your long-term roadmap in order for, the, for you to achieve the design outcome that you want to be. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So uh, what I'm hearing is that, you know, keep the sort of a final goal in mind and uh, build sort of work towards that goal. Right. All right. Cool. So um, I think that's it. We kind of barely scratched the surface here on, on platforms and the, this this field called market design, which uh, which uh, we study a lot at ASB, I in particular study. But um, I think that basically concludes our webinar for today. Um, I did want to. Uh, let people know though that um, there is this uh, uh, a bunch of a series of sort of online learning where you can um, learn more about you know different types of um, questions here. So cybersecurity, work from home, uh, regulatory developments, etc. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and um, scan the QR code, and it will give you more information on that. All right. Um, but yeah, so thank you again, Chen Chao, Kang Kai, for, for sharing. And uh, thank you all for the wonderful questions. I wish we had more time. But again, just scratching the surface here. All right. Um, I thank guess you. I conclude uh, the end of the webinar. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, Kang Kai. Thank you, Chen Chao. Thanks, Manati. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, all bye. right. Bye-bye.